Teddy, I need to tell you something. You are not able to effectively test your VO2 max by chasing your brother across the house in a full sprint, okay? That, that doesn't work. There he is, go get him. Why, hello there, endurance nerds. If you've ever wondered whether the number on your watch is a fitness metric or a random number generator in disguise, you're not alone. Today, we are taking a crowbar to another one of endurance sports' most misused metrics, VO2 max. Who do you love? Who do you love? For decades, it's been treated like a crystal ball. Slap on a gas mask, suffer through a treadmill death march, puke into a trash can, and walk away with a number that supposedly tells you how fit you are, and maybe, just maybe, how fast you'll be next season. Except it really doesn't. Not like that, not in a vacuum, and definitely not the way your smartwatch wants you to believe. This number gets thrown around like it's gospel, but when you strip away the mystique and the marketing, the O2 Max is a lot more boring, a lot more limited, and a lot more misunderstood than people really want to admit. So let's fix that. Let's start by agreeing on terms and defining this magical metric, shall we? VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can take in and use during intense exercise. It's measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And that unit matters. It's weight relative. So if you gain or lose five pounds, your score shifts, even if your physiology doesn't. What it's really capturing is the total throughput of your aerobic system. That includes how much blood your heart can pump per beat, which we refer to as stroke volume, how efficiently your lungs can transfer oxygen into the bloodstream, and how well your working muscles extract and use that oxygen. If any one of those systems underperforms, your VO2 max stalls. And with that in mind, it is a real physiological constraint for athletes. Oxygen is the foundation of aerobic performance, right? And the reason that so many people are obsessed with this number is that it correlates reasonably well with elite level endurance performance. You're not seeing Tour de France podiums or Olympic 10K finalists with VO2 max values in the 50s. At the sharp end of competition, a high ceiling can really matter. You need that horsepower. But, and this is where people get tripped up, plenty of elite level athletes win with VO2 max scores that would barely impress in the lab, and plenty of athletes with monster scores fall apart the second a race gets unpredictable. Yet people still obsess over pushing that number ever higher, as if their athletic ability automatically rises with it. It's like hearing that grip strength correlates with longevity, then buying a spring-loaded grip trainer thinking that it'll make you immortal. Which is more likely, that long-lived people get there by squeezing handles all day, or that grip strength is just one side effect of a whole set of health-promoting behaviors? Give it about four seconds of real thought and the answer is pretty damn obvious. Correlation is not causation, and a high VO2 max alone does not make a great athlete. But even if VO2 max were a perfect predictor, it's often sabotaged before the conversation even starts by how poorly it's collected in the first place. A proper VO2 max test requires a metabolic heart, gas exchange equipment, and someone who actually knows what they're doing. You're ramped up to a near-death effort with a mask strapped to your face while somebody in a lab coat screams at you to keep going. And to be valid, your oxygen uptake actually needs to plateau, meaning that even when the workload increases, your oxygen consumption does not. That's the textbook definition, but in practice, most people quit from leg fatigue, bad pacing, or pure discomfort long before they reach any kind of oxygen uptake limit. So what you'll more often see is that oxygen uptake continues to climb without leveling off until the test is aborted. Even well-trained athletes cut it short because one system fails before the others. So you're going to end up walking out with a number that doesn't in any way reflect your max. It reflects the point at which something else gave out first. That could be your lungs, your legs, or your ability to tolerate suffering with a snorkel jammed on your face. And if you took the test on a bike and you race on foot or you use a garbage ramp protocol with bad staging, no, it's not even the right wrong number. And if the lab test isn't uninspiring enough, let's talk about the even sketchier version, your smartwatch. Most athletes never set foot in the lab. They get a VO2 max estimate from a Garmin, Polar, Suntu, Apple Watch, and all too often treat it like it came from a peer-reviewed journal. Let's be clear, your watch is not measuring VO2 max. There's no gas exchange, no controlled ramp protocol, no plateau verification. It's just an algorithm making a guess based on pace, heart rate, sometimes power, and a few baked in assumptions about how these metrics correlate with oxygen use. If your heart rate is low at a given speed, the model assumes you're efficient. If it's high, it assumes you're not. Then it drops that into a database of other users that estimates your aerobic capacity based on population level averages. That's it. The result might be close or it might be wildly off, and you're unlikely to know which because the model only works if the data feeding it is clean, consistent, and contextually appropriate, which let's be honest, it usually isn't. Let's say your watch is too loose. Optical heart rate data can go haywire. If you're using a power meter that drops signal intermittently, it breaks the pacing logic. If you're training in the heat, your heart rate spikes at lower efforts and the model thinks that you've lost some fitness. If you do intervals or variable pacing, it misinterprets the stress and gives up. If you wear a chest strap one day and a wrist-based heart rate the next, your trend line becomes a Rorschach test. I can go on. 
It's not necessarily a lie, but it's not a measurement either. Relying on it to give you solid insights on your training, fitness, or longevity is putting your trust in a rough guess. That said, if you're consistent, the overall trend can still be useful, especially in running where pace and heart rate tend to follow a cleaner relationship than in cycling. If you always wear a chest strap, train in relatively stable environments, and stick to steady state efforts at least a few times a week, the estimate can show you whether you're trending up, down, or stagnating. It won't tell you why, it won't tell you what to do, but it can act as a signal worth watching. Just don't treat it like an absolute. Use it as a secondary or tertiary metric. Nothing more. Now, just a quick pause before we go further. If this is already making you rethink how you look at VO2 max, hit the like button so more athletes see it and subscribe if you want more deep dives like this one. But even when the test is done perfectly in a lab with breath by breath gas exchange and proper staging, the number itself still doesn't tell you how fast you are or how well you perform when things go sideways. Because VO2 max doesn't say a word about how much of that capacity you can actually use. It doesn't measure lactate threshold. It doesn't account for how you're running or cycling economy changes with fatigue. It doesn't reflect your ability to stay composed at hour three or whether your fuel cooling strategy holds up when it's 88 degrees and your gut stops cooperating. It's silent on efficiency, on durability, and the dozens of small decisions and metabolic trade-offs that make or break endurance performance. Athletes with lower VO2 max scores but strong fractional utilization, which is a term that refers to the ability to operate closer to your ceiling, routinely outperform people with bigger engines but worse control. That's not an accident. Performance lives in the messy middle, just below your max, just below failure, and is contingent on variables well beyond what the lab ever measured. Yes, VO2 max can tell you what's theoretically possible under perfect conditions. But training and racing are not about perfect conditions. They're about what you can hold when everything else starts falling apart. Now, if you train consistently and collect decent data, yes, VO2 max can be helpful for watching those long-term aerobic trends. If it creeps up alongside your rising threshold power or pace, that's probably a good sign your engine is adapting. If it dips after a month of inactivity or illness, that also makes sense. And it gets more useful when you put it next to something like lactate threshold. What's more important than your max aerobic capacity is how much of that aerobic capacity you can actually sustain. Two people with identical VO2 max scores might have completely different thresholds. One can hold 90% of their max and the other fades at 75%. Their VO2 max numbers alone do not explain the difference, but the relationship between other metrics does. If you are a highly trained athlete who's already done the hard work, built your durability, refined economy, tightened up fueling and recovery, and you're still seeing a ceiling that you cannot break through, then maybe. VO2 max is your limiter. Maybe it's worth focusing on in that case. But for everybody else, if your threshold is rising and your VO2 max isn't, that's probably the best case scenario. You're squeezing more out of the engine you already have. Pros spend years, sometimes decades, doing precisely this. It's funny, people want to mimic the pros when it comes to expensive gear, morning routines, or the number of hours that they post in a single session. But when it comes down to having the patience and the consistency to do the boring work, they don't wanna hear anything about it. And if you're in that camp, you might wanna reflect on why that is. But if you're wondering whether you should go pay for a lab test, ask yourself this. Do you already know how to apply the result? Do you have the context to use it alongside your training data, your power curve, your recovery patterns, and so forth? Or are you just following the latest pro or worse yet, influencer, and hoping for a number that makes you feel fit? If it's a second one, save your money. You do not need a printout to tell you whether your training is working. Your legs are already doing that. Now, if money and time are no object, test away. But understand that while VO2 max is trainable, it's not infinitely so. Genetics matter more than people want to admit. Some athletes are born with massive stroke volumes, high hemoglobin, dense capillaries, and lungs that can oxygenate blood like a wind tunnel. They show up to a starting line with a VO2 max of 65 before they've even done anything structured. There's also a wide range in how much VO2 max responds to training. Some athletes see big improvements with the right workload. Others make almost no progress at all, even with volume, intensity, recovering, and nutrition all being on point. The gap usually comes down to baseline physiology, things like your heart chamber size, total blood volume, hemoglobin concentration, pulmonary diffusion, mitochondrial density. You can nudge these, but you're mostly working with the hardware that you were born with. Keeping that in mind, you gotta ask yourself, well, how much you really wanna know this number? If your result comes back with something underwhelming, what then? Does that discourage you from pursuing your goals? Do you think that holds you back from racing well? Does it become a convenient excuse to shy away from the hard work? Or maybe if you're genetically gifted, do you rely on that natural talent too much and wonder why you're not mopping up the field every group ride or race? You need to evaluate your own psychology to answer those questions. But I would encourage you to make sure that you are testing for that number for the right reasons. And it's also important to bear in mind that a lot of the biggest jumps in VO2 max happened because someone dropped weight, not because they got meaningfully fitter. Since VO2 max is weight relative, shedding 10 pounds of non-functional weight can move the needle far more than six months of hard training ever could. But if you drop functional mass, you can make yourself slower even as that number starts to go up. 
So you really need to set realistic expectations for how much you can push your VO2 max and if you really want to use it as a training metric. If you're untrained or coming back from a long break, you might see a 15 to 25% increase in a few months. But once you're aerobically fit, those gains shrink. Most trained athletes will see maybe five to 10% at best and you're not going from 50 to 70 unless you're an outlier or have significant mass to lose. And yes, I know some of you have been patiently waiting for me to outline the benchmarks, what's considered a good VO2 max. Now, recreationally fit adults often land in their 40s, well-trained amateurs into the mid 50s and low 60s and elite endurance athletes are usually in the 70s or higher with those rare outliers hitting the 80s and above and those ranges are for men women's vo2 max values are typically about 10 to 15 percent lower at every performance tier mainly due to differences in hemoglobin concentration heart size and lean body mass the part people miss is that those numbers don't really draw a hard line between average and exceptional research has shown that vo2 max explains only a fraction of performance variance in trained athletes while factors like movement economy fatigue resistance and how close you can operate to your ceiling account for more of that gap. Those qualities are built by training all the energy systems, not just by staring at a VO2 max score. Now at risk of talking out of both sides of my face here, you should still remain mindful that VO2 max naturally declines about 5 to 10% per decade after age 30 unless you deliberately work to slow it down. Stop training your high end and the drop can be steep enough to alter your performance in just a few seasons. That's why for masters athletes, keeping a small but regular dose of real high intensity work in the program all year long is worth it. You don't need to live at red line or hyper fixate on it, but if you never revisit those suffer heavy efforts, your max aerobic capacity erodes faster than you think. But broadly speaking, the qualities that actually decide outcomes, things like durability, threshold, efficiency, and execution are far more adaptable, and most athletes haven't even come close to maxing those out before they start worrying about their ceiling. Maintaining your high end matters, especially as you age, but fixating on VO2 max wastes energy that you could spend on things that generate performance breakthroughs. And if you've been around the channel for a while, you've heard me make this argument before. I dedicated an entire video to dismantling the obsession with a singular FTP value and laid out a much more valuable constellation of metrics to track if your goal is to become a stronger, faster athlete. I'm not gonna relitigate all of that here, but all of those recommendations are going to apply to those with a compulsive focus on VO2 max as well. If you haven't watched it, I'm gonna link it in the description so you can dig in more from there. But the bottom line is if you're following a proper periodized plan, your VO2 max will naturally track towards your genetic limit without micromanaging it. Whether it's 57 or 61 is far less important than whether you've built the capacity to use it under real world conditions. And even if you are one of those rare cases where VO2 max is your bottleneck, adapting your plan isn't anything earth shattering. During your build and sharpening phases, instead of threshold sessions, your two key sessions can focus on intensity. Think two to five minute intervals at 105 to 120% of your functional threshold power or pace with long enough rest in between reps to hit it again. That gets stacked on top of consistent aerobic volume and cleaning up everything else. Fueling, recovery, strength, and economy. You're strategically focusing on the weak spots in your output curve in a properly structured plan, not ripping your legs off every day because you don't like your VO2 max number. People chase VO2 max like it's going to explain why they're strong one day and unraveling the next. It won't. The adaptations that win races live in the chaos. It's how you handle fatigue and how you execute when the plan falls apart. If you're improving, you already know it. If you're stagnating, no score is going to fix it. Use the data if it helps, but the best athletes I know are too busy doing the work to obsess over how much oxygen they could process in theory. But if your VO2 max number has gone up, gone down, refused to budge, drop it in the comments. No shame, no flexing. Let's talk about whether it's ever actually mattered. And if you spent too long chasing it, welcome to the club. We have snacks. You can eat those snacks while you're doing all of the YouTube stuff down below. Thank you guys all so much for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.